So um, we're going to start today with a session on police reform and transformation. It's clear to me, I'm sure it's clear to all of you, that there are manifold challenges facing the police. It's complicated, unprecedented challenges, really. And at a time of scant resources, it seems to me that throwing money at the problem isn't going to be the answer. So clearly, the police needs to modernise to deal with all these challenges. Crime is changing. There's an explosion in cybercrime. Traditional crimes like burglary had been falling until the July figures. So are the police successfully changing? I think the results of the Personal Resilience Survey are not particularly encouraging in this respect. The boss knows best, command and control structure appears to be alive and kicking. So more than half of those surveyed, 58%, say that it is unacceptable to admit errors. A quarter thought that the chief officer team showed bullying rather than supportive behaviour. So pretty sobering, I thought. I just want to play a video before we get started with our speakers, just to put, put this all in some context. Okay, so I'd like to welcome our speakers to the platform. We're going to hear some home truths on all of this from Paddy Tipping, who's Police and Crime Commissioner for Nottinghamshire, and Sarah Thornton, Chair of the National Police Chiefs Council. So please welcome them to the stage. I want to start... Uh where Gavin started in his uh, presidential uh, address on Monday. And it's important to say thank you. You know, when things go wrong, it's really easy to call for a public inquiry or to appear on Channel 4 News. Uh, but we don't say thank you enough for the many things that go right. And things are tough at the moment. All of us are working harder, doing more with less resources. And we live in a real uncertain time. Brexit, new president of the United States, the best you can say about him is, he's unpredictable. A standoff with North Korea, a government that doesn't have a majority, flooding in the States, Sierra Leone, Pakistan, coming closer to home, the involvement that you've had with Grenfell Towers, and of course, the terrorist attacks in Manchester and London. And that's really unsettling and uncertain. And people are looking for stability. The people in this room and the people you work with provide a pillar of that stability. So I want to say thanks for doing that. And thanks for inviting me here to Stratford. I'm a great visitor to Stratford. I normally go across the road to the theatre. Heard about your dinner last night, and I guess none of you got across the road to see what was on last night. Julius Caesar. Let's just think about the plot. A strong and stable leader being stabbed in the back <laughs> by her political <laughs> colleagues. And uh, I, I kind of had a look at what Shakespeare had to say about the police. I'm sorry to say to you that uh, superintendents don't get a mention in any of Shakespeare's plays, but constables appear 40 times. And uh, I just brought a couple of quotes from uh, Henry V. The first one is, I tell the constable, my mistress wears her own hair. Good investigating techniques there, I think. Uh, rings of domestic violence and serious sexual assault. And I think more tellingly, the uh, quote from the king himself. Let me speak proudly. Tell the constable we are but warriors 
for the work, working day. Warriors for the working day. Feels like that sometimes, doesn't it? Warriors, working day. And broadly, you divide Shakespeare's plays into tragedies and comedy. And I think the policing landscape is a bit like that at the moment. The real tragedy, and you've talked about it throughout the conference, is the austerity that affects us all. 2.3 billion pound reduction in grant, uh, 20,000 police officers lost their job, 25% reduction in police grant. That's a real tragedy. But the comedy, and I think this is the black comedy, the ironic comedy, is that we're reluctant to talk about it. What astonishes me is that every day we have stories about the NHS in crisis, how schools need more money, how the generals are arguing that the armed forces are under threat. And where's our voice? And I think we've been reluctant historically to use our voice and to speak up strongly because we don't want to give the impression that we've lost control. But what's been important over the past few months is that that discussion is beginning to happen. That we are beginning to say, we've got to have more resources and we've got to change. They're not two contrasting things. They're part of the same process. And if the budget has been cut on that kind of scale, we need to do things about it. And we can do things about it. We can stop doing things. Uh, Sarah has scars on her back for suggesting uh, that we stop doing some things. Even the chief inspector, Tom Windsor, has got scars on his back for suggesting that shoplifting isn't a top priority. I know there are some of you who'd like to see deeper scars on Sir Tom's back. But uh, uh, as well as that, we can just let the service erode. I mean, I think if we're honest with each other, and there's no point having meetings if we're not honest with each other. We all know that neighbourhood policing is being eroded. We maintain it's still there, but the reality is it's pretty thin and it's pretty stretched. So the alternative is to work together to try and persuade people that we need more resources. We were lucky the Comprehensive Spending Review in 2015. Let me take you back to it. We've been asked to look for further cuts of 20% over four years, on top of the 25% that we had before. And we got a good settlement, a flat cash settlement, uh, which the government talks endlessly about. But what we need to be clear about what we need to talk with consumers about and talk with partners about is that that flat cash settlement means real terms <coughs> cuts into the future. I think this year, halfway through the year, the police service will lose 2,500 jobs again. And if things don't change, there'll be the same kind of figure into the future. And what a flat cash settlement means is that taking into account budget pressures, that uh, uh, each year we're £200,000 uh, less in resources than we need. Every year we're going to have to make a further saving of £200,000. I think that's going to be pretty hard and pretty tough. And that's why I'm delighted that I've been working very closely with Sarah and Dave Thompson at the West Midlands Police to prepare a case for the budget in November. Because we've got to change, persuade the government that things have changed since 2015. The pattern of crime has changed. The resources we've got has changed. Partners are in difficulty. And we've got 100 days to do that. Next week, we're going to finalise our submission to the Treasury. What we're going to argue for is a two-pronged approach. First of all, we're going to make an argument that we need some real terms growth. Not flat cash, but real terms growth. 
And I don't know, we haven't finished the discussion yet, but I think we'll be making a bid for several hundred thousand pounds. Whether we get it or not is a different matter. But we need to be clear that the service faces difficulties and we've got to invest in it. But alongside that, we've got to persuade colleagues in the Home Office. And I think it's quite interesting that the Home Office are beginning to talk our language. I was really interested in the points that the Minister made to you when he was here on Monday. I think we've got a partner there that we can work with against the Treasury to try and get some more resources in. But what we've got to persuade people is that if we need more resources, we're going to use those resources wisely and we're going to use them as a way of changing into the future. I've just become chairman of the Police Reform and Transformation Board. I've got a bit of a history about this uh, in that some years ago, I said to Theresa May when she was the Home, Home Secretary, why don't you keep some money centrally, big sum of money, and use it as change money. And I can remember her saying, that's a really good idea, Paddy. We'll have a think about that. So what have they done? They set up a police transformation fund. Last year, uh, there was available money in it for new projects of about 65 million pounds. There were 112 bids came into it, which totaled 1.2 uh, uh, million, uh, more than the fund had got. And I think we've focused a lot on that fund and how we spend that fund. I think the argument has been about how do we get our money back? How do we do things? And I want us to change the way that we use that fund. And I want us to use it with you to have a discussion about, say, what are the top five elements of change into the future? What are the five things that we could do nationally with a sum, maybe next year, of 300 million pounds to make a difference, to make a change. And that's a debate we're going to have. I want to stop arguing about these small sums of money. And I want to have a real debate, a real discussion, right across the piece to say, we've got 300 million pounds, what would make the difference? And I tell you what I think would make the difference. Uh, people don't agree, but that's fine. I'd like us to see us have better joined up IT and back office systems. And it's clear to me that all across the country, there's some great pieces of work going on uh, in the east, in the southwest, in my own area in the East Midlands. Some great bits of work. But these are islands by themselves. And I'm not convinced that we've got bridges across. I'm not convinced that we have standards that we can apply universally. And I think very shortly, perhaps by the back end of this year, we'll be saying to colleagues in the forces, yeah, you can have some money, but it's got to conform to these standards. It's got to meet these tests. And that's going to be controversial, but I think we've got to do it. And I think we've got to demonstrate to the Treasury that we can meet the targets that people have talked to us about. Uh, we've been asked to make savings of £350 million. Pounds. I think it's quite interesting. The police are asking, being asked to make efficiency savings year on year of 3%. The NHS have a target efficiency saving of 2%. The Foreign Office have an efficiency saving of £1.2 million. Pounds. But we've got to demonstrate that we can use our money wisely. And I've just been in dialogue with Nick Hurd, who told you, as he's told many of us, you've got too much in reserves. Let me tell you that I said to him earlier on last week that the reserves had come down by half. They'll come down by half again. We've got to demonstrate that we're getting best value out of procurement. We're on the case. When I used to work at the Home Office many years ago, I used to say to oh, the officials, why is it? We've got 43 police forces. They all wear different uniforms. You know, don't you think we could change it? 
oh, it'll not happen, minister. It's tradition. Well, listen, austerity is forcing us to change. Simon Cole, the chief constable in Leicestershire, and I know more about cargo pants than anybody else in the country. Uh, but we've got to do that. We've got to demonstrate that we're not just buying more carefully, but that we're sharing resources. The discussion with fire service and uh, the NHS around ambulance service, I think is important. But actually, I think it's the wrong target. I think the people we need to be working with are local authorities. That's why I'm delighted that across Nottinghamshire, most of our neighbourhood teams, and eventually all our neighbourhood teams, will be alongside local authority colleagues. Because trading standards, environmental health, are valuable tools with us to make that change. Now, I don't think this is going to be easy, because we have a history of 43 police forces, 43 police and crime commissioners determined to do their own things in their own communities. I'm not against that at all. What I think we've got to do is, in a sense, bite the bullet. If we want extra money, we've got to change. We've got to be able to demonstrate that we're using our resources as wisely as possible. And I'm not confident at the moment that we can do that. My challenge to you, because you're senior leaders, my challenge to you is let's have a discussion about how we do that. What do we need to do to make that change? How far can we cooperate? Cathy's slide at the beginning. What needs to be done locally? What needs to be done on a regional level? And what needs to be done nationally? We know the questions. When I used to teach at the university, they used to say to me, Dr Tipping, you're good on questions, but you're useless on answers. And that's my challenge back to you. What are the answers to this? How can we set up a discussion, a way of going forward to take these matters forward? So I know what the questions are, but I don't know what the solutions are. But I know this, that we can't go on like this. We can't go on losing £200 million a year, year on year. Quite simply, it's unsustainable. So we've got to make that bid. We've got to argue for extra resources. We've got to work hard. Gavin made this point uh, when he spoke to you earlier this week. The relationship with the Home Office is pretty good. They want to help us. They want to work with us. But they need to demonstrate that we can make a difference, we can make a change. And shortly, Sarah will do all the heavy lifting. Think about police and crime commissioners. They do the easy bits. They leave it to the force to do the difficult bits. Uh, but she'll talk through some of the processes that we've got in line at the moment to try and do that. So my message to you is fairly clear. I've got an agenda. I've spelt out my agenda. It's not an agenda that everybody exists, accepts. But I want it to be an agenda for action. So the thing that struck me working with the police is that operationally, you can do things dead quick. But in terms of developing policy and strategy, because there are so many players, it becomes difficult. And that's the challenge. And the challenge is straightforward. If we accept that agenda, if we take that challenge, working together, we can make the, take the challenge and we can make the change. So once again, thanks for all you've done. And please join in the debate that's before us because the situation going forward is untenable unless we bring forward some new ideas, new answers, new solutions. Colleagues, it's up to us.
Good morning, everybody. Um, it's great to be here in Stratford, and thank you very much for your kind invitation. And I think it's uh, really important that Gavin and the team wanted Paddy and I to speak on reform and transformation. I hope that you will reflect, after I've spoken and we've done the Q&A, that in terms of strategy, we are absolutely as one. I just have a bit more detail, I think, as Paddy mentioned. Um, the other thing I wanted to say before I started to talk was just to say something about the relationship between chief officers and superintendents, but in particular between the National Police Chiefs Council and the Superintendents Association. Um, I believe very strongly that the blue team is always stronger when it works together. And that includes chief officers, supers, uh, the federation, and also the staff associations. Uh, and I hope that Gavin and Paul would reflect that I actually walk that talk. We have regular uh, joint coordination uh, committee meetings. In fact, we've got one uh, next week. Uh, we do have uh, a significant joint agenda. And I'm always struck when we discuss the key issues around the table that there is so much that unites us and very little that divides us. Uh, and one of the good examples of that, I think, was earlier this year when Paul led on all our behalf on the work around bail and was the spokesperson for the service. And I think that was the first time ever in policy terms that we had the Federation, uh, Chief Officers and the Supers Association completely in agreement about our public position uh, and our analysis. And I would hope that we would find other, particularly operational issues, where in fact there is a, a, a unanimity of thought within, within the service. And the other thing, and it was mentioned uh, first off this morning, is the work that you've done on resilience. And we had a presentation, a briefing at Chiefs Council in July, um, listening very seriously to the issues that were being raised, both by yourselves and by the Federation uh, of England and Wales, uh, and a real commitment from Chiefs to work in all forces to make sure we're dealing with those issues. Because to, to echo what Paddy was saying, uh, we don't uh, in any way uh, take you for granted, and we understand the pressure and the stress you're all under. So, to reform and transformation. Um, oh, there we go. You, you beat me to it. Uh, we're in Stratford. I actually went to see Julius Caesar at Stratford about four weeks ago. And hopefully most of you can remember your O-level English, maybe, when you maybe studied Julius Caesar. Um, but there's a great quotation about change in there, which I've used before with my colleagues. But basically, after Brutus and his uh, colleagues have murdered uh, Julius Caesar, there is then a, basically civil war. Isn't that often the case? Uh, they get rid of the strong leader. And then there's the two factions. There's Cassius and Brutus. And there's Mark Antony and Octavius. And they're having, having these battles. And Brutus and Cassius, who end up losing, by the way, um, are having a debate before the battle about whether to strike now. And it's about taking opportunity and change. And there's a great quotation. And, and I just think it applies so much to where we are at the moment. There is a tide in the affairs of men, which taken at the flood, leads on to fortune. Omitted, all the voyage of their life is bound in the shallow and miseries. On such a full sea are we now afloat, and we must take the current when it serves, or lose our ventures. And I think in terms of reform and transformation, we have an opportunity now that we must take. We must take it because we're at full tide. And you heard what the minister was saying on Monday about the work on reform and transformation. So in terms of uh, how we get here, some quotations, which I don't think any were to this conference, but to various conference and events uh, since 2015, a real change in focus. So we have there Theresa May talking about Over to You. Uh, we have Brandon Lewis talking about a self-reforming sector. Uh, and lastly, we have uh, Amber Rudd again talking about self-reforming sector. So the kind of the, the position, the strategy couldn't be stronger from the Home Office. But of course, all of us who are in policing know this, which is from uh, a review by David Weisburn and Anthony Braga. Um, police departments are highly resistant to change and police officers often experience difficulty in impl implementing new programs. Of course, that's not true about any of us in this room. We're not resistant to change, are we? Mm. <coughs> Unless it affects ourselves. Um, but that's the background in which you've got very kind of high uh, strategic ambition, but a reality that change is, is difficult. So what have we done with the police and crime commissioners over the last um, 18 months? Well, the first thing we did, and it took quite a while to agree, but we got there in the end, is say, okay, what is it that we're trying to achieve jointly? 
knowing that you know, every force represented in this room will have its own strategy, will have its own objectives, police and crime plans, but actually what are the things that we can uh, agree on nationally? And so we end up with those uh, five themes and the Policing Vision 2025. Um, focus in terms of local policing, on integration and joint working, on specialist capabilities, about developing new capabilities and sharing what we've got, on uh, enabling uh, business enablers, the, to the, the to sort of thing that Paddy was talking about, which is about how much more can we share, whether it's technology or back office. Digital, about the absolute need to transform uh, our uh, ca capability and capacity uh, in terms of digital policing. And lastly, the workforce, with real themes on representativeness, uh, good leadership, uh, and the right sort of skills for, for modern policing. So that was the vision, um, signed off and agreed by police and crime commissioners, and launched our joint conference uh, last November. So, okay, having a vision, what does that mean? What are you trying to achieve? And I'm, I'm, I promise you we'll put this on your website, because I looked with horror about how small it's ended up. But suffice it to say, having done the vision, we did a lot of detailed work saying, okay, what are the outcomes we're trying to achieve? Uh, and eight outcomes, I'll just pick out um, the, kind of the key words there. In the first one, about proactivity and prevention. The second one, about, again, network specialist capabilities. The third, about um, seamless modern channels. All the work you've been doing about you know, channel change, making sure we use the most efficient ways and effective ways to contact and be contacted by the public. How do we use data? How do we capture it? How do we analyze it? How do we share it? You know, it's not about technology, frankly. It's about data. Um, but on technology, um, what can we do in terms of infrastructure, digital platforms? What can we do together? It makes no sense uh, for 43 to be doing the same thing. Linking in to number six about the enabling services. One of the uh, pieces of work that's been funded by the fund, which I'll mention uh, in a minute, is um, procuring together or giving every force the opportunity to procure the next uh, level of productivity services, so all the basic office stuff we have on our computers, um, and looking at how we might uh, use commercially available storage. Um, I, I have to be careful because I don't want to be product specific, but it's the sort of thing that um, Microsoft 365 does. Can we actually have a, a system whereby we all use the same sort of kit, the same sort of standards, and also with a, an absolutely uh, joined up approach to identity access management, can we then, you know, Goodness, you know, if I were to, to go into a computer in Warwickshire here um, with my kind of MET uh, credentials, could I get on uh, and start working? Uh, of course, that's not possible at the moment, but wouldn't it be great if we could do that in the future? Number seven, uh, about integrated uh, service delivery, which is very much about working uh, across forces with partners uh, and across internationally. And last of all, workforce, uh, and by no means least. Uh, diverse, motivated, and capable. So those are the sort of outcomes that we have worked up in detail. And what I thought I would share with you, just to give you a sense of having done the vision, okay, what does that mean in terms of outcomes, we've then divided uh, the, the work into those five areas of, of the vision. And we have projects in all of them. Now, in a way, you'll say to me, and if I was in your seat, I would say to me, there's an awful lot of projects there. And to a certain extent, that's because we're living with a legacy of the Innovation Fund and a lot of bottom-up bidding. As Paddy was saying, you know, he'd like to have five or so big things. Uh, and what we've got, when I'm, I'm going to do a whistle-stop tour through the all five, you will see there are an awful lot. Um, but uh, we are moving to a situation where I think we will have fewer, uh, bigger programs. So the first one is in terms of digital. What I've done, and you can't read it all, and I'm not going to read it all to you, but what we've tried to show of the, in the 27 prospective projects uh, listed on the left-hand side, how will they help us to tackle demand, how will they benefit the public, and how will they support the workforce? And what's in bold there is the variety of different uh, projects that we're supporting within that digital uh, uh, area, uh, and very much uh, about getting uh, more money spent, but actually that consistency of standards, and in particular, using uh, digital much more with our uh, contact with the public. So digital policing, the first big block. Um, second one, uh, specialist capabilities, 24 projects in this. Some of it is the work that I've been doing specifically on those top seven, around armed policing or surveillance or cyber, but it's also all the work we are doing now to have a, a consistent approach to undercover online in the regional units, uh, about ensuring that uh, we develop 
a, a variety of different capabilities of the NCA, in, particularly, in particular intelligence sharing capabilities, uh, making sure that we're doing an awful lot more in terms of um, how we work to identify um, victims, identify vulnerability, specific money around modern slavery, around child uh, sexual exploitation. So a whole range of areas there. And, and this particular uh, area has a mix of things. And it's the point that Paddy was making about Cliff Edge. Some of this is about spending a bit of time thinking about how do we organize ourselves um, to be as effective as we can be. But some of it is about buying capability today. So in here is the firearms uplift, as I say, the undercover online, a lot of the modern slavery assets, uh, a lot of the issues around Operation Hydrant and the link on child sexual exploitation. So we do have some significant issues that there's quite a lot of really good things which are currently paid for out of this fund, but in future, um, if there isn't a fund, there is a problem. Third area, business enablers. Uh, again, picking up those words uh, that uh, Paddy was using about common standards, share procurement, uh, integration with fire is there as well. 19 projects in, in this area, um, and the last section uh, about the technology platforms. I'm really excited about the potential for something like Office 365, really excited about doing something to join up our access management. The way we do identity access management in forces at the moment, if any of you know anything about this, it is so terribly complicated and therefore very, very expensive, and there are much more simple and straightforward ways uh, to do it. It will require quite a lot of work to get there, but if we get there, the prize uh, is enormous. The fourth area is local policing. Lots of focus here very much on um, collaboration, evidence-based um, prevention work, uh, work around uh, enhanced victim care. You'll have heard the minister talk about the Video Enabled Justice Initiative in um, Kent, Surrey, Sussex, and parts of the Met, which uh, the government are going to support. A whole range of things uh, to improve victim care, but also thinking very carefully about what can we do uh, centrally to help all of you around these multi-agency platforms because everybody is trying to do different sorts of things, share different sorts of data, look at different sort of analytical tools. And what is the potential to do some of that together so we learn from the best? Really difficult stuff because there's massive pressure on all of you to develop these sorts of things. But what you can see from where I sit and where Paddy sits is there's an awful lot of uh, activity which is being repeated. And again, we probably shouldn't do workforce last, but it is the last one on this slide, but it's by no means least. Uh, and at the moment, there is a, a very large figure on uh, investment of 156 million. I, I don't think it will go through at that sort of level, um, but uh, a real focus on what we can do to um, build the workforce, build capability, uh, address issues of diversity, uh, make sure that skills, particularly around issues around vulnerable people, uh, are really dealt with. And, and the last point on there about the welfare service, you'll have seen the Home Secretary made the announcement uh, a couple of months ago now about really wanting to focus on what can be done nationally to um, provide the best possible support for officers and staff uh, throughout the country. So um, a whistle-stop tour, I just wanted to give you a sense of uh, we have a vision, we're clear on outcomes, we've got like programs of work which have a logic to them. There's probably too many, um, but that's, we are victims of history on that. We, we do have a, a plan, and uh, we can share more of the detail of that with you. But it's not straightforward. I started off with the problem about change uh, in policing. Um, the other thing that we have here, despite Paddy's great suggestion to Theresa May several years ago, the difficulty about having a change programme with 86 sovereign bodies who all start from different places, do not have a shared detailed understanding of the destination, and who exist in a normal state of competitive rivalry. I don't know whether the superintendents regard uh, your kind of forced relationships as competitive rivalry, but certainly um, it's the case sometimes with chief officers and chief constables that there's a sense of competitive rivalry, uh, uh, I'm sure. Um, that's why we spent quite a lot of time being quite clear about um, where are we now? What is, what is it that we want to achieve? Because if we don't spend time doing that, um, then we are really undermining any opportunity to do some unified change. And can, can I be quite clear? This is in no way undermining what happens locally. Um, but in a world of, of globalization, in a world of crime, so much of which is international, 
in a world where we still have that local focus on the 43 in England and Wales, it is so uh, necessary to do work together. It makes no sense for the public, for the people we serve, to do a lot of this separately. But I don't underestimate the difficulty of trying to do it together. And, and just to go through some of those challenges, um, maintaining localism while tackling modern and global threats, I guess that's the point I'm making. And I'm, I understand absolutely the value of localism. Uh, I've spent uh, nearly all my service uh, in local police forces. Um, but I also understand that the threats that we deal with are very often uh, not local. And how do we uh, address them effectively is an important question. Um, secondly, um, I talk about a lack of capability to self-reform. So it's, it's great that ministers say you're a self-reforming sector. Um, but as you all know, if you're going to do change management, you need a change team, you need people, you need capability, you need capacity. Uh, and one of the difficulties when you're tr trying to uh, work on a kind of annualised basis is you end up using consultants much more than you ever would. Uh, we are really working hard with the Home Office to try and address that. But I know, I mean, for police officers, we can just about uh, second people. That's not impossible. But for police staff, and very often if we're talking about change experts, their police staff, you know, how do we offer somebody a job? which is only 12 months, and expect good people to apply. If it's two or three years, maybe it becomes more attractive. But it is a real issue about, actually, um, do we have the capability and capacity nationally to, to self-reform? Benefits management. For those of you who've done change, you will all know about the importance of business benefits, defining benefits, making sure that benefits are delivered, um, making sure that people are accountable for benefits. And you'll know sometimes that costs lie here and benefits lie here. Can you imagine how complicated it is trying to do that in terms of all forces? You know, who delivers the business benefits? Well, my argument is that probably the only people who can deliver the business benefits are the people in the forces. But what does that mean you can do at the centre? And how do you create a structure which convinces the Home Office and then convinces Treasury that actually we spent some money, we've done this change, and you know what? We've delivered the business benefits as promised. So kind of really complex, and all your... Um, project and program management courses you've been on would struggle to work out how you deliver business benefits uh, over 43 forces. Uh, legal ambiguity, no single point uh, of accountability. The Police Reform and Transformation Board, which Paddy chairs, uh, and I have sat on for a couple of years now, um, we are, I think, what do we call ourselves, an unincorporated association. We have no legal status. What we do is we try and get people to work together. It's all about persuasion, influence, negotiating, and then we advise uh, ministers. Um, so there is no single point of accountability. There is no kind of statutory body underpinning any of this. Um, because of its 86, our agility is often poor. Um, trying to get buy-in is complicated. We, you know, we have been doing on, on technology. And I, if any of you get invited to the second uh, uh, tranche of technology roadshows, I, you might look at the invite and think this sounds rather dull. Uh, it's not dull, I promise you. Um, I've been to them, go to them. We're doing a whole series of regional ones over the autumn. They will give you a really good overview about what's coming down the line in terms of home office programmes, some of the work we're doing, some of the work that's going on in forces. There is so much, maybe it's too much, um, in train, and you need to get your head around it. You must have heard the phrase now that, you know, every organisation has got to be a technology organisation. It is not possible nowadays not to be a technology organisation. So you need to know what's being planned and you need to work out uh, uh, how you fit into that and what your needs and requirements are. And, and lastly, it's rather a crowded change landscape. Um, there's operational change. I suspect every force represented in this room will have some sort of new force model or transformational change or whatever you call it. Um, Lots of work happening regionally, and I, I think that's the biggest change I've seen in the last two years, um, the tremendous input that's gone into regional work, um, and, of course, work that's been done nationally as well. So kind of quite a crowded landscape and really difficult for people at, uh, at superintendent level and chief officers to kind of navigate it. And so I'm going to finish with just a couple of thoughts about the future, um, kind of reflecting on what we're trying to do and I hope I've told you a reasonably cogent story. Um, we did some work with the Police and Crime Commissioners in July, just reflecting on where we got to, and uh, what we called politically challenging options. <laughs> um, we are not going to go back into 
the number of force arguments. But of course, one of the obvious uh, solutions would be fewer, larger forces. But we know the issues around that. Uh, another way would be if the Home Office mandated more and gave more direction. Well, some people sometimes ask for that, but uh, beware of what you wish for. Uh, as soon as that started to happen, I think everybody would complain like mad. Um, stronger regulation requiring more uniformity. Um, there has been, I, I would say until 2015, there has been a reluctance in Home Office to do that. I think since 2015, around some of the issues around technology standards, issues around efficiency, that I think there is a growing desire to maybe have a little bit more uniformity. But bear in mind, um, we're not going to have any legislation because of all the broader political issues. So we're very much in the territory, I think, in the middle of refining the current system. Um, we, have been, we are going to build our central capacity a bit more um, through the Transformation Fund. We've been working with this concept of the coalition of the winning. It's not about a mandation fest. It's not about telling forces to do what they don't want to do, but it is about saying, look, there's a really good opportunity here. Come and join. And that's on the whole the approach we've taken. And also constantly focused on this idea that we are separate forces, and that's really valuable, but we are networked. The public expect us to work together. And if you've seen uh, the emerging work on the attacks in Manchester and in London, the extent to which there was uh, mutual aid and support across forces, the way in which the NCA stood up massive resources, you actually see that network in action, and it's really compelling. And, and we just kind of put out there a couple of, of new ideas. Is there more opportunity to work with the private sector uh, as uh, partners in change, as delivery partners? Um, or indeed, um, the unthinkable is the last one. Do you remember the MPIA? <laughs> uh, well, the last point is just saying, is there something about having uh, a greater capability to um, organize and corral change across the kind of three key areas, sort of strategy and policy, people and technology? Because at the moment, uh, all that's pulling them together is a, a board, which is an, un um, an, what is it? an unassociated corporation, whatever the phrase is, i.e. not statutory, uh, and also the coalition of winning. So it's, 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 um, it's working. Uh, I think we're making progress. I'm very proud of what we've done. Um, but I hope you get some sense of which, uh, of the extent of the challenges uh, that we're facing. Thank you very much. Thank you both very much. Two very challenging presentations there, complete with Shakespeare quotes, which is um, a very erudite way to start the day, I think. Um, so. I've got lots of questions. I'm going to kick off with a couple to you. There's lots coming in on the app, but I would really like questions from you in the audience as well. So please don't hide behind the app, otherwise um, I'll have to name and shame people. Um, Sarah, I just wanted to start with you, um, and I know you're probably sick of hearing about this, but there was this outcry, wasn't there, when you suggested that the public shouldn't necessarily expect to see a police officer after a, a crime like a burglary because of the increase in terrorism and cybercrime. Do you think that, and I'll come back to whether the police are ready for these kind of reforms, do you think the public are ready for these kind of reforms? The um, public clearly weren't ready for those kinds of reforms. Um, would be my conclusion. We just need to uh, wind back because um, I made those comments in July 2015. And it was at that point, as Paddy was explaining, before the spending review in November 2015, when all our forces were looking at what 25 to 40% reductions in main grant would look like. It was in that context that I was saying, if you're going to do that, then we're going to be looking at game-changing um, options. That was the context. But I'm not going to walk away completely from that point. I was at uh, Alison Saunders' lecture last night, uh, and, and she said on the record, you know, thinking about going forward, uh, why can't we have apps that are about reporting crime and, and loading up um, digital materials straight away? And I, I think that in five or ten years' time, we'll move that way. But to answer that your long? question... Five or ten years' time? Maybe three, but I think it'll take a while. <laughs> Good, we're moving fast. We're moving, no, we're, I, I said there was a problem with agility. Um, so, so to answer your question, um, are the public ready for it? No, I mean, I think my, my uh, reflection on that, they weren't ready for it. Um, but that's not a reason why we don't continue to say these things. And we know, all of us, 
wherever you've done this in meetings um, or uh, in front of uh, councillors or on radio phone-ins, I'm sure you've all got experience of it. Everybody knows what we should do more of. Very few people are ever willing to say what we should do less of. Paddy, do you think the public are ready? Should they be ready? I think it's quite interesting. Sarah was talking about doing some work with the private sector. We've been doing quite a lot of work with PwC recently. And uh, if you go to the public and say, uh, what do you want? Traditionally, it's the Dixon of Doc Green, officer on the beat. But when you say to people, what do you really want for the police? We want the police to come when we really need them. And... Uh, uh, in, in a sense, uh, we need to keep that discussion going. Again, Sarah's just been talking about the, the, the public meetings that, that we all do uh, with people. I mean, I often say to people, you know, your ch kid has got more chance of being abused in their bedroom now, online, than they have on the street. And that's a reality. And if we can get into that debate, I think it's going to be quite helpful. Can I just ask you just to pull the microphone just a little bit closer to you? Can you hear Paddy at the back, everyone? Yeah, OK, maybe it's just me. Um, well, so uh, both of you sort of tiptoed around the question of wholesale reform. Um, and namely, I mean, Sarah, you said you talked about fewer, larger forces. But why not go the whole hog? I mean, we've seen massive consolidation in the media sector, for example. Now, I know the media sector is very different from policing. But why not a single force? across the whole country? Um, there would be colleagues who think that... I, I think there would be very few who'd want a single force because they would say the value uh, of those local connections would be lost. There would be quite a few colleagues who would say we could have fewer larger. But um, for about five years, chief officers were in danger of being a one-trick pony around this issue because that's our answer to everything about money and change was if there were fewer larger forces, everything would be okay. Um, politically, that's not going to happen. The problems still um, exist, therefore we need to come up with other ways of doing it, which is what the Reform Board and the whole kind of portfolio of change that we've developed with the PCCs is. So that's what I'm focused on, dealing with the uh, issue, dealing with the difficulties, dealing with globalisation, dealing with um, the changing nature of crime and, and realising that politically it's just not an option. Now, but isn't that, that that's sort of lacking courage, isn't it? It's not lacking courage. It's about um, some of these decisions are political. And, and, and to be clear, the position, as I understand it from ministers now, is that if in two force areas the police and crime commissioners and the chiefs come with a proposition which makes sense and has local support, then they would consider it. Uh, and that might well be happening. Um, but I think for us to constantly uh, have only one refrain is, is, is not wise. Um, Paddy, what's your take on this? Uh, I, I used to work for uh, Charles Clark when he was Home Secretary, and he wanted to move to uh, regional police forces. Uh, I, I was in the uh, government whips office at that time, the kind of business managers, and I had to tell him, we'll never get that through the Commons. And uh, the Home Secretary, Prime Minister now, has made it very clear uh, this would require primary legislation, and she's not prepared to do it. Uh, I think we've got to move forward by consent, uh, but it means that you go forward at the pace of the slowest. When I parked in then the... that's never going to happen. You know, nothing's going to change. Well, things do change. I, when I parked in the car park, I stood parked next to a police van. Always park next to a police van. <laughs> you know, you're going to be safe, you know. Uh, but Warwickshire, West Mercy are on it. In effect, it's one force now. Uh, I mean, we've got this bizarre situation. We've got two forces that are basically one force, two chief constables, two deputies. Uh, but I think we can move that way. Uh, and uh, uh, I think we're going to have to move that way. And I think people will take it. Well, there's a, many questions on this on the app, so I've sort of consolidated them into one, but this one um, sort of takes it on slightly. Sarah, to you. Um, I've heard the same points made for 20 years. Many of the blocks have been that chiefs and now PCCs are reluctant to take the next step. The cap badge becomes more important than an optimum service. How do we break down the barriers and make this change happen? How do we create the necessary consensus? Um, I think we are joining up a lot more. Um, so what you've got is the cap badge, the local identity, um, because bear in mind, um, 
most money in policing is local, the democratic accountability is local, and the identity is local. But I think what Paddy and I are trying to do behind that is to say, how much can we do this joined up? So whether that's the specialist capabilities, the extent to which we're sharing, whether it's firearms, investigation, intelligence, terrorist assets, counter-terrorist assets, organised crime assets, whether it's about technology, whether it's about shared procurement, there's all that kind of thing. So we're trying to have the best of both worlds. Um, now, I've got lots more questions on the app. I've got lots more questions in my head. Uh, but I want to make you guys here do some work now because um, these panellists have been working very hard. So please um, put up your hands, ask a question. There's something happening at the back there. That would be great. Thank you. Um, please say where you're from as well. Yeah, Charlie Hill from West Mercia in Warwickshire. <laughs> I couldn't resist, Sarah and Paddy. You may not know, and people in the room may not know, we've clearly had two chiefs, two deps, and two PCCs. As of Friday the 1st of September, the two ACCs, who previously worked across local policing and protective services respectively, are now single force ACCs. One for West Mercia local policing, one for Warwickshire local policing. One of the deps has taken on the role of protective services direct report from a chief superintendent who's working across both forces. Um, we, we, we've moved away from a, a strategic alliance, in my view, to um, a collaboration around protective services, finance, and enabling services. And frankly, we need some real leadership from chief officers and PCCs to step up to the mark and say, I am prepared to give up the sovereignty, move the organization forward, Two FTSE 100 companies do not merge and have two chairmen, two chief execs, two deputy chief execs. And so are you offering to give up your job? No, no. Well, I, I'm a chief superintendent. I'm, 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 I have harm reduction as it is in policing portfolios across both forces, and I report now to two ACCs in that respect. But the reality is the chiefs, a chief constable will need, and a PCC will need to give up their job and offer themselves up and have that merger. And, and Charlie, I'm, I'm disappointed to hear that, but I'm pleased that you're joining in the debate and, in a sense, arguing from our side of the table. Because one of the points that uh, Sarah made on her slide was we are pretty fragmented. You made progress here in uh, uh, Warwickshire, West Mercia, when you had people who believed in that and wanted to go forward. I think the other thing that is going to happen is that I think the austerity is going to drive things even more. I think there was more a mood of cooperation when we faced the CSR 15 and 25, 40% cuts. But let's be real about it. In the present circumstances, there are a number of forces, you know them, I know them, that within the next 12, 24 months become unviable. Uh, they're too small, uh, they can't survive by themselves, and that financial pressure is going to force change. Sarah, comment from you. I mean, I think it's the same point I was making earlier, that this is about a political decision. The situation, as I said, is that the um, government, or the, the Home Secretary would say, it's got to be PCCs, chiefs, and local support, and they will consider it. And then, as you say, it requires primary legislation. So there is a very high bar. Now, that is just the framework within which I'm operating. Um, we could, you know, we could push um, to say that's not a good idea, but we live in a democracy. And I think the point that Paddy made, I mean, I can remember, I was first, I was an acting chief in 2007. Uh, and was told by the Home Office that we were to work with Hampshire to work out how we could amalgamate the forces. Quite frankly, all the forces, with a couple of exceptions, and with a all the chiefs, with a couple of exceptions, worked with their colleagues to come up with plans. The reason why it didn't happen was not because of chiefs, it was not because of police authorities, it was about the politics yeah. and the naked issue about getting legislation passed in Parliament and also the link to, unfortunately, uh, Charles Clark, and I'm sure you told him to deal with this, had not dealt with precept equalisation. Yeah, yeah. So if you've got two forces that are going to amalgamate uh, with very differing levels of precept, unless there was a plan for equalisation, 
uh, you were going to have to go to the lower of the two precepts. We should have taken chunks out of these amalgamated force budgets. There was no deal with Treasury on that, and therefore there's no deal. So uh, in my experience, when the service has been asked to get on and do the planning, we've done it. But actually it falls because essentially it's a political decision. Now I can argue it both ways politically, because I do think, compared with a lot of countries that I've seen in terms of their policing, that local connection that we have with communities uh, is very important to us. And it is a debatable point with politicians about if we did have more remote forces and indeed a national force, the extent to which those local relationships would be undermined. And I think at the end of the day, that is a political decision for politicians with a big P, not for chiefs. And uh, with, a, with no majority, politicians aren't going to oh, take that decision. So we should basically park this now. Let's look at the Queen's on. speech. There was yeah. virtually nothing on policing. Yeah. So let's have another question then, please. Give us a wave because, you know, we've got here. Great, brilliant. Just here. I feel like an auctioneer going for the highest bidder. Jill Wharton from Thames Valley Police. Um, nice to see Chief Constable and Thornton on the stage, our former Chief Constable. Uh, I'm not going to ask a difficult question. <laughs> and I was really pleased, uh, Paddy, to hear you talking about the IT. So I want to reflect back almost two decades ago when Peter Nairud was Chief Constable in Thames Valley and he had a road show and I was an inspector at the time and I asked a question about why if we had national crime recording standard, national intelligence model, we couldn't have national IT systems. And, and I will never forget the quote. The quote was, you are naive if you think that is achievable, inspector, in the current climate. And at the time, I was really horrified, and I thought, oh, that will definitely change. And then here we are almost two decades later, and things haven't changed that much. So my concern is that if, whilst I absolutely accept that the, the political issues around the, the 43 forces, I do think some things need to be mandated to make it happen, because if it's left to chiefs and PCCs to make decisions, my fear is that they will continue to go it alone, or maybe in collaboration with one or two partners, when actually, a lot of money could be saved by having things mandated where everybody had to have the same. I mean, the issue really is who does the mandation? The Home Office has been very clear that they're not going to mandate, uh, that we've got to make decisions at a local level. As Sarah has quite rightly uh, pointed out, the PRTB itself has got no powers whatsoever. So it's around persuasion. And we've been able to secure you know, a big sum of money. I don't know whether it'll survive into the future in this scale, but in 1920, 2019-20, I think we could have £650 million in the PRTB. That would be enough for us to begin to do wholesale IT change. But prior to that, we've got to have a discussion across the piece about what we want. Now, I know things were difficult 20 years ago and you were a pioneer then, but I actually think the mood is changing. I think among chiefs particularly, less so amongst PCC, but it's happening, there is that desire uh, to try and come to common standards. Common IT solution doesn't necessarily mean that we've got to have one national system, but what it means is that we've got to have systems that talk and communicate with each other. And I hope by the end of this year, the end of this calendar year, we'll have some propositions about how we might do that. Sarah, a question for you from the app. How can we move to a culture of learning rather than blame? Oh, that's one of my favorite ones. Can I just, can I just um, answer on that sure. other question first? I agree uh, completely about the need for greater consistency and that's why Paddy and I and others, particularly the technology officers, have been working on how we can actually agree common standards. Maybe not particular applications, because we don't want to be dependent on one supplier, but common standards. It's going to be very difficult, but I think there's a, an agreement at a national level we need to do that. But, but in all seriousness, I can tell you about so many different national uh, bits of technology, from CRASH, which is the system for road traffic collisions, to the old uh, special branch intelligence system, where there will always be forces who, for some reason, think they're exceptions. And it's, you know, it's really difficult. Chief officers will go, uh, or other people will go to home office and say, we need this national system. We get money for it, it's developed, and then 23, 24, 25 forces get involved with it. Why the others don't? Because it's, not, it's very different in their area. And we have a tendency to exceptionalism, which I think we really need to challenge ourselves very hard. 
And sometimes the chiefs are exceptionalists, but I promise you, sometimes people in this room are exceptionalists as well. So I think there's a culture we need to challenge, which takes me nicely on to uh, learning uh, and blame. OK, you know, it's very easy when things go wrong to make sure that he gets the blame and I don't. Um, it's the very worst thing for an organization. So what works for us as individuals is really bad for organizations. Um, we have been doing some work with uh, Matthew Said and other people. Um, we've done a, a, a very kind of lengthy uh, report about the way in which we think the culture needs to change. It's not about not holding people to account, but it's about creating an environment in which people can talk about um, trying things that don't work, um, when things go wrong, how can we create an environment where we can learn rather than blame? I think it's really, really important. And I think it does need to, to start from the top, and that's one of the reasons why chiefs, as chiefs, have been discussing it a lot. Um, I'm about to set up a kind of a steering group um, to oversee a bit of a plan working with the college, working with the IPCC to think about how we might begin to do some of that. And I have a, a bit of a love-hate relationship with Tom Windsor. Uh, uh, Interesting. Uh, I, I, I love it. He hates it. <laughs> and uh, uh, the point of contention is this, that uh, what we've got to use uh, inspection services like uh, HMIC, like Offset, is to look at good practice and develop good practice and promulgate good practice. And the inspection regimes that we've got at the moment are basically about identifying failure and we need to turn it on its head. Last opportunity for a question from the floor. Well, obviously we've got another session coming, but yeah, just here, please. The mic's coming around to you. Morning, Darren Rawlings from Hampshire Constabulary. Um, a question is about a, a multi-agency um, partnership vision 2025 rather than the police because we constantly hear we're stronger in partnership, weaker in silos, we should shrink together, not shrink apart. Policing isn't just an issue for the police. We should take a family-centred approach. And um, I don't really want to know what information probably West Midlands have on the police. What I want to know is what child services, adult services, health education in Hampshire, be it unitaries or statutory authorities, have. And the Policing 25 vision is very good, but if we're really going to work in partnership in the future, why haven't we got a multi-agency 2025 vision, not just a silo police one? Uh, and Darren, I, 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 th I think that's really important. And I think it's important to recognise that partners are struggling today. And we've had a 25% cut. Local authorities have had a 40% cut in grant. Uh, they've run out or running out of things to do. All over the country, we've got what's called STPs, Strategic Transformation Programmes in the NHS. One of the games I play, uh, Cathy, is to ask for audiences like this, who's read the STP for their area? It's about major NHS change. And we've got to be part of that, Darren. And, uh, Have you read uh, yours? I've read mine, yeah. Well I've certainly read mine. And uh, uh, what I've got, uh, Darren, coming up, and uh, I'll keep you in touch with it, is that I've got a group of people coming together in the autumn right across the public sector to say, for me to say, really, and some local authority leaders and the NHS as well, we can't go on like this. Really, we've got to change. We've got the same people from our organisations going through the same doors. It's a crazy situation we've got into, and we really have got to have a fundamental discussion about public services, the shape of them into the future. I think it's a, a really good suggestion. Um, what I see all the time working at the national level is the extent to which government departments work in silos. Uh, and what you have uh, is join up tending to be around themes. So whether it's uh, domestic abuse, modern slavery, um, violence against women and girls, there's a range of kind of joint mental health, joined up activity. But to have something which was much broader, um, I think is, is some way beyond us at the moment.